I'm very pleased to be joined by Ozzy Pebera, he's a reporter for the New York Observer. Welcome to Citywide. Thank you for having me. Recent headline in the New York Times, New York mayor's race is shaping up to be sleepy. Is this campaign over before it even begins? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to rule out the candidacy of, of, of anyone at, at this point, but there does seem to be a lack of enthusiasm about the challengers to Michael Bloomberg. I mean, people have recounted about the power of incumbency, the fact that the mayor's approval ratings and his coverage in the media is, is pretty favorable, and the fact that he has a lot of money. It makes it hard to imagine somebody beating him at this point. I noticed in the article, 19 paragraphs, the mayor is quoted in five of those paragraphs. Bill Thompson, his presumptive challenger, not quoted in any of the paragraphs. What does that say about the New York Times, and what does that say about the Thompson campaign? I'll, <clears throat> sorry, I'll leave it up to others to kind of analyze what the Times perception and relationship is with the mayor, but I think the Sam Roberts piece that you're referring to is an analysis piece, and the idea seems to be that the race is less about the people who want to replace the mayor and really about the mayor. In fact, it, it appears as if, at some instances, this race is, is a referendum on the, on the mayor, whereas in other campaigns, for an open seat perhaps, the race would really be about the challengers. I think in the presidential campaign, there was not a sitting member of the White House who was running to carry on the administration's goals, and what you had was two parties really advocating about their own candidates. And what we're seeing here in the mayor's race is really about the Democratic candidates and even the Republican candidates. They're all talking and focusing on Mike Bloomberg. So the question is more about who he is rather than who his opponents are. Anthony Weiner, in uh, dropping out of the race and endorsing uh, Thompson, uh, famously described the mayor as vanilla Coke, that um, it didn't matter how much money they spent on the campaign because given his um, exposure as the mayor of the city of New York, right. um, voters were going to make up their own minds whether he left a good taste in their mouth or not. It didn't matter what he right. what he said. So that sort of supports the notion that it's a, it's a referendum on Mike Bloomberg. Right. It, it's it, it's also another colorful quip from Anthony Weiner, a guy that reporters seem to enjoy covering because he gives us lots to write about, colorful quotes. But it, it, it also, I think, tried to undermine the notion that it was a fait complete that the mayor's money predetermined the outcome of the election. I think Coke has spent a lot of money kind of pr promoting vanilla Coke, and, and, like, that was the idea. And the idea was, no matter how you dress it up, the result is sort of what you know and feel and, and can understand, despite the advertising. I think that was also part of what Congressman Weiner was trying to say in making that analogy. There's Some folks have suggested that what Thompson needs to do is to make a virtue out of a necessity. In other words, He's not going to be able to match the mayor dollar for dollar. If he does land some type of verbal blow on the mayor by challenging him over the course of the summer, it's early enough that the mayor can drown that out by right. ramping up his advertising. And therefore, Thompson's only shot is basically to spend the summer doing fundraising and organizational stuff, and then sometime after Labor Day, when people start to pay right. attention, use everything he's got sprint to the end and hope right. that he catches up. Is that a viable strategy? I'll, I'll leave it up to, hit to his advisors and voters to determine if it's viable, but I think an obvious challenge to that kind of idea, and it's also a challenge facing candidates running in lower ballot races, is we're, they're all operating in an environment where the mayor's campaign is spending a lot of money, more than anyone can, can wrap their minds around in, in, in some instances. If, he, if Michael Bloomberg is able to campaign and get his message out through paid media on such a consistent basis. Well, if everybody moves in after Labor Day or, or at, at the end of the summer to start going up on the air and start doing mailers, it's going to get... Th there's an argument that says it'll all just get lost. By that point, they'll be so inundated with the Mike Bloomberg mailings from earlier, plus public advocate candidates, four, five of them, perhaps, if, if members from, from the Republican Party start doing mailings, in addition to council candidates, in addition to public advocate candidates. I mean, there are so many candidates who are looking to get voters' attention, and if everyone waits for the last minute, there is an argument to be said that maybe voters who hadn't been contacted earlier are just going to tune out. 
So if it's not Thompson's to win, it, 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 I guess it's Bloomberg's to lose. And there has been some um, attention paid lately to uh, the mayor's temper, to his uh, being sometimes less than diplomatic about how he phrases things. And his reaction is, I am who I am. Right. Um, th most recently, there was the comment about how much you know, President Obama gets paid. He had a remark to, to me about the appropriateness of, of a question I had asked him. Um, I think what people are, I, I think one thing that's allowing these kind of stories to, to kind of get attention, not speaking to how much of an impact they will or, or will not have, but it's, it's hard not to note that these kind of stories are, are happening at a time when there is a story like Sam Roberts' story saying the race is a sleeper, there's not much going on. Reporters who are on the beat expecting a, a mayor's race have found themselves covering something that doesn't feel like a, a mayor's race. So when you have a gaffe, when you have a, a, a misquote, that seems to occupy the space of where a, a traditional kind of campaign story Yep. Which talented candidates were. So uh, let me ask you that because it, it's also it's an easy story to write. It's, right. it's instant. Um, it gets played up on the blogs. It gets repeated um, uh, in, uh, in print. Um, are the reporters covering the harder stories to write? I mean, if you travel with the mayor, right. so whatever it is that the mayor says, that's going to be the, the story. But to what extent do you think... Um, the mayor is getting a free ride uh, from the press in terms of looking at the impact of his programs, promises that he made. He seems to be defining the agenda. He wants to talk a lot about education. Right. Um, he talks a lot about crime. Uh, and he talks in general terms about sort of economic development. Right. Um, but issues where the administration maybe hasn't been as successful he doesn't talk about them, and nobody else does either, homelessness and, and the like. Right. Well, well, I think the last thing you said is, is actually kind of crucial. No, nobody else is. There is a question to be asked is, where are the validators? Where are the other people who are coming out and, and picking up on criticisms that have been made of the mayor? If they don't exist, it's questionable as to whether they really are complaints to begin with. You know, it, it's like if a tree falls and no one hears it. Did it really fall? Well, if nobody's complaining about this, is it really a problem? Well, how do you, you know, let's put the observer aside for a second, sure. but focusing it on the, on the three dailies for a second. Mm -hmm. um, the publishers, uh, all wealthy men, um, all met with the mayor, all gave their blessing to changing the term limits law, uh, sends a kind of a unmistakable signal to everybody that works for them as to, as to where the paper is uh, focused. I think there's been somewhat of a rebellion by the reporters. You know, he sort of won the, won the owners but lost the reporters on the term limit thing. Right. But the fact of the matter is, is that the three major dailies endorsed the mayor even before they knew whether he'd be eligible to run again. Right. Well, as Sheldon Silver has, has demonstrated, endorsements from newspapers only go so far. Um, but it is fair, I think, to question the, the communication that the mayor has had with publishers rather than with editorial boards. But I do think newspapers, the three dailies, and, and almost any newspaper, whether they admit to having a, an agenda or not, I think any newspaper, any editor, any reporter will say, no matter what is the clear message coming from the top about agenda, every newspaper will go after a story ex exclusive or not. I think the New York Post is the one that broke the story about Martha Stark. The New York Post editorial page has been... The finance commissioner right. had some issues and ultimately resigned, right. Who, who, it, it came out of the New York Post, which is a newspaper that has not generally taken on the mayor um, in, in, in an undue fashion. But they did not kill the story or bury the story, but in fact, they were the ones who broke it and a, resistor, and a commissioner resigned, and the mayor, for that brief segment, did not come out looking as good as a mayor would like. You spent a lot of time with him, covering him, right. seeing him up close... Um, speaking at, at many different events. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of, of why he decided to run for a third term and, and what, what he thinks he's going to accomplish in a third term? The reason he's given publicly, and he's given it quite often, is that there are things to be finished. There's an economy that needs his type of guidance to, to get the city through. I think the, 
the renewal of mayoral control and keeping progress going in, in, in education is arguably one of his biggest ones. There's been a lot written about the development plans he's had for downtown, for Ground Zero, for the, for the West Side. I mean, the, the, um, even the Convention Center in Queens and, and Bullets Point, there were a lot of grand plans that just didn't bear to fruition. And some people argue he's, he's looking for a legacy. There are others that are arguing he's a guy who felt so strongly about the city, he didn't want to walk away during its most challenging time, almost the way that you can imagine Bill Clinton sort of wishing he had another term to deal with the international issues that confronted his successor rather than the kind of pox Americana that, that, that he had to deal with. So I think the, what the mayor has said most recently is that there are things left undone, which is what incumbents always say when they're seeking another term. It's just that his happens to have the caveat of the extension of term limits and an argument about the economy at the time. You know, mayors and mayoral races tend to block out the sun in terms of, of, <laughs> of politics because they're such central and accessible figures. We're right. going to talk about some of the other political races that are going on and, and how the news gets covered on Citywide Continues right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're talking politics with Ozzy Pebera, a reporter for the New York Observer. All right, so we've done the mayoral race, at least as it, as it stands uh, now. Um, next down ballot spot city controller, four candidates, all members of the city council, some differences in terms of geography or ethnicity or, or right. agenda. Um, but all of them had worked closely together on a variety of issues over their seven years or more in the city council, all of them um, can claim credit for many of the same victories in the right. council. So how do we handicap that race and what really does separate those candidates? That is a great question. And even the candidates, I think, have had a hard time identifying a vote here, an issue there that they didn't agree on. There is a difference in terms of how they voted on term limits. I believe uh, John Lewin, David Weber had opposed it, David Yasky had supported it with some reservation at the beginning, and I believe Melinda Katz may have voted for it. I, I can't immediately recall. But then, without those issues, you really have to look at the campaigns they're putting together and, and what kind of support they're having. Um, it looks as if John Liu is putting together a coalition of Latino and, and African-American elected officials. He's talking about diversity issues, and he also has the endorsement of the Working Families Party, labor, and things of that nature. David Weprin, his emphasis has been on his resume, look at what I've done, and he talks the most about experience in, in that argument. Uh, David Yasky sort of comes at this trying to articulate the progressive reform transparency issue, and Melinda Katz, who has a very accomplished record in the city council, also does not fail to remind people that she's the only woman in the race and that that's a voice that should be heard in office. So do you have the sense that any of them are starting to resonate with voters, or too soon to tell also? It does seem to be too, too soon to tell. I know th th there is a perception that, that John Liu is perceived to be the front-runner or organized labor in a down-ballot race that, that is not getting as much daily attention. You look at which candidate has a, an apparatus to actually pull out voters, identify them, and actually like work on election day? And it seems to be coalescing behind John Liu, but that is not to rule out the other candidates by any means. Well, let's look now at the public advocates race. That's right. the other citywide uh, campaign. Two of the candidates, Eric Joya, Bill de Blasio, also council members, although with somewhat different styles and, and, right. uh, and approaches to this. And then we've got two veteran public figures, I would call them, <laughs> neither in public office at right. the moment. One, Mark Rain, the former uh, public advocate. Uh, the other, Norman Siegel, Civil Liberties Union, who's never held public office. Uh, where does that race stand? That's a very interesting race. Mark Green sort of is in a position that Freddie Ferrer was in 2005. He's considered to be, by all intents and purposes, the incumbent in the race, yet he doesn't have the power of incumbency, meaning an office and a staff, to operate with. So he starts out with the expectations kind of higher for him, yet he has none of the usual benefits of having an office, and that actually sets him back slightly. So he, he has this like weird... But he has the most name recognition. He has the most name recognition by far. And it's, 
and, and it's arguable as to whether or not that is a floor or a ceiling for him, but there's no disputing the fact that most voters that you approach on the street know who, who he is already. Um, Norman Teagle appears to have the second highest name recognition only because he's possibly has run for the office before, has usually been in front of lawsuits and, and dealing with, with, with issues that, that sort of get a lot of attention. De Blasio and Julia are occupying a very similar space. They're council candidates that are kind of arguing that there needs to be a stronger check on the mayor, that the, and, and, and there's, it, it's hard to separate them from the fact that they've voted similarly on a number of issues. There's differences here and there, but they are the council candidates who are trying to go citywide. Joya seems to have built a very substantial, what I'd call a, a personal following, an operation. An extraordinary yeah. number of people who have contributed small amounts of money to him using the Internet, yeah. energetic, traveling all over the place, whereas de Blasio seems to be concentrating more on racking up institutional support from unions, the Working Families Party, and the like. Yeah, the, the, the emphasis on Joya's biography is, is, is something that can't be separated from, from the campaign that he's trying to articulate. It, it seems in, in one sense that it's, it, it's almost like John Edwards, who said, look at me, look at my biography, look at who I am and how I grew up. And he staked a lot of credibility in, in his campaign as to who he is. Now, now, that's not to say that, that there's anything akin to what brought down John, John Edwards after the race is lurking in Eric Joy's background. That's not to suggest, suggest that at all. But he does say, when you ask him, why are you running for this office, he starts talking about who he is and how he grew up. He sees his life as an extension of what he's trying to do in office. And, and everyone sort of makes that argument. He makes it more succinctly, more often than most people. Bill de Blasio, as, as a former campaign manager, a guy who's like really put together co coalition, he, it, it, it's almost impossible for him to, to speak about the office without talking about coalitions, bringing people together in a way that it seems to be that's how he views the world and that's how he sees articulating what the office should be doing in, in vis-a-vis the mayor and the, and the council, how he's an oversight for them. One of the things I'm, I'm puzzled about is that there don't seem to be any political movements in the city, except to the extent that the Working Families Party pushes a redistribution of wealth kind of agenda. But the Obama campaign, and I know this was Hillary country, right. but the, a lot of people were engaged by the Obama campaign, particularly right. after he became the nominee. Uh, there have been some efforts for people to sort of right. self-organize in that community, but it doesn't seem to have resulted in, in the articulation of a series of policies or leaders that have emerged. You don't hear people at the water coolers talking about the General Motors bankruptcy. <laughs> um, everybody's scared about the economy and their right. jobs, and I guess to some extent whether it's going to affect whether a new building goes up in their neighborhood or not. We've had any number of elected officials who were charged with corruption or in some cases right. violence, but there's no reform movement. It's just sort of like nobody seems to care whether local politics in New York changes or not. As a reporter that covers local politics, I kind of feel that you know, the, the attention that could be paid to local issues, I would like it to be bigger. But in, in all honesty, New York City is a place where a lot of industries come and people come here at the top of their game in many of the fields, acting, business, real, real estate. But when it comes to politics, you know, New York City may not be the Big Apple in that regard. There's a, there's a lot of activity here, but if you want to talk about professional political activity, you, you, it's arguable that you could look to other places. <clears throat> um, the, the death of civics and civic engagement in New York City has been spoken about. You can argue that with people being so interconnected with the Internet, you don't need political clubs anymore. Well, it's also the, <clears throat> what I'd call the nationalization of politics, where people right. would rather watch um, congressional leaders debating on CNN right. than watch city council members debating on New York water. Right. And, 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 but to be fair, <clears throat> I think CNN has made Congress more accessible in a way that the city council has not made themselves as, as accessible. There's no live streaming of, of their meetings. Their, their, their agendas are kind of like put out by happenstance at times. There isn't the same desire, will, intent, or interest um, in seeing the council operate day to day. If it did, would it change? That's unclear. The, the, there, there was a movement in Albany to get television coverage of legislative sessions. Well, bef before that, the, before it was being televised, the argument was if people saw what they were doing on the floor, th things would change. You could argue that it has. 
But speeches it, got longer. Speeches got longer. People got more theatrical. And you know what? That's fine because now there's, they have to be in their seats in order to vote and, and great. But there is still the opportunity to avoid the camera spotlight because now, <clears throat> now members can just ask to go into conference. Conferences are close to the press, close to the media. So where the dialogue and decisions are made can be moved depending on where the television camera and the attention is, is focused on. If there are cameras brought into the council, it could be argued that the, the, the debates that you would expect to see on the floor might be made somewhere else. So it, it's, it's questionable as to how do you get people more engaged. I, I don't know. That's for policymakers to kind of figure out. But, but, but it is fair to ask, like, where are people having that conversation? So who are some of the, 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 the up and coming? Who are some of the rising stars? Who are the, some of the really standout, substantive, charismatic leaders that may not get on, you know, the, 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 you know in, into the news as much uh, because they're, they're still earlier in their career that you think are going to be, you know, Im important to, to New York going down the line? Um, Rising stars, it, it, it's, I'm not going to name any of the current council members or elected officials for fear that it might be looked at as, as an endorsement, but, but if we were to just look at s staffers, perhaps, people that work for other people in, in office, um, Stu Lozer, the mayor's spokesperson, say what you want about the mayor and about the press operation, it's unquestionable that Stu Lozer is one of the best in, in terms of his profession. Um, you could... You could also look at some of the commissioners in, in agencies. Um, Joel Klein has, has his critics. Ray, Ray Kelly has his. Um, in, in terms of rising stars, there's Eric Kuo, who's a spokesman for Simca Felder. Seems like he's very young, seems to have a long future in this business. Michael Lasher works in the education department. One of the youngest people operating in city policy and in city politics has unquestionably one of the sharpest minds in New York City, and I would not be surprised to hear of him going on to much bigger and better things. So what gets you up in the morning to, to go to work and to cover this scene? <laughs> I would say my alarm clock, but that's not always true. I, I think that the thing that I kind of look for and, and wonder about is what is happening in the city and, and how are these big mysterious, powerful forces that kind of create rules. How, how, how is that being made? What, what, what is going on? I mean, I, I remember a time when, I, I remember my interest in, in journalism started because I was driving in Albany on my way to a restaurant where I was working at, and I heard a, a, a radio reporter refer to uh, George Pataki as just another guy from Yale running for president or, or something like that, or looking to run for president. I remember thinking, you know, this is like an Ivy League guy, and for him, it's just run of the mill. But for me, it's like, I, I, like, like, who, who is this guy? What's going on? So, I kind of wanted to see, who, who are these people? It, like, I kind of think of, you know, covering city politics and, and policy. In a way, you, you could view it as it's, um, it's like a soap opera, but with smart people and real consequences. You know. My thanks to Ozzy Pivera, a reporter for the New York Observer. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.